So, hello everybody, and welcome to our next general developer meeting. Here in uh, today in in this meeting, we are going to focus on a new features, APIs, and functionalities that are coming uh, in the next Moodle 2.9 release, going to be uh, released soon. We invited some HQ developers as well as well-known Moodlers from uh, from the community to present some things new, some new things, as well as share their experience with these new APIs. Uh, we will have, we have an agenda, uh, agenda list uh, in, in our wiki page, and we are going to basically follow the program uh, as, as a listed with this agenda. So let us start with a presentation by Andrew Nichols from HQ is going to talk about a new uh, new handling of the temporary directories in Moodle 2.9. Andrew, can I ask you? Yeah, sure. Um, just uh, this is only a very very quick one. Um, whilst we've been looking at some of the code recently, uh, one of the things which has become apparent is that we make use of the temp directory quite a lot. Um, we've got two ways of doing that primarily. The correct way, which was make temp directory, which is a function which has existed for many years, um, and people using the config tempter uh, configuration variable directly. The make temp directory um, is always meant to be uh, used in such a way that it's uh, cleaned up after the request. It shouldn't ever be used, or well, historically it should never have been used uh, to share code between servers or between different processes. Um, that's something that's always been documented but never been respected. Um, so to try and correct things, I've created a new function called make request directory, uh, which you should use if you possibly can uh, instead of make temp directory. Um, and essentially all that does is to create a brand new directory um, in your local cache there. Uh, it's always empty. Uh, it always creates a brand new directory. And at the end of the request, it deletes your uh, request directory. Uh, which basically means two things. It, it helps people who are trying to do things like uh, clustering, uh, and it helps keep your cache directories clear and prevent space filling up uh, for things which shouldn't be actually filling that up and shouldn't be using that. And as a result of that, the temp directory, we've removed the warning that it, should, uh, it shouldn't be used in a clustered environment, and it should now be shared amongst web servers. That's something which has always been documented as you shouldn't do, but it's never been possible to do that. So we've just taken away the restriction, or the recommended restriction. So that's pretty much what I had to add there. Um, and the details are in the issue, which is issue number 44874. And the details are in the, the details of that issue are in the, uh, the meeting notes. That's everything, really. Um, I am hoping to backport that to stable branches as well to encourage plugin developers to make use of that. Um, it's not so, hopefully, it hasn't been long enough yet, uh, but hopefully that will be something we can use for 2.7 and 2.8 as well. Oh, excellent. Uh, did I get it right that the details are also, or the issue is also linked in the release notes in the developer section? Uh, it should be. Uh, it should be, the, Yeah, yeah we'll, should be. we'll check that. Cool. It, it, uh, thanks for thanks for the info. Uh, I'll just, I don't expect any, any questions regarding this yet. But let me just quickly check. Nothing there yet. Uh, nothing there yet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move to to other point in our agenda. I would. Uh, I am very happy that Urs Hunkler uh, agreed with uh, sharing his experience with or first experience with Mustache, the new template framework that is coming in 2.9. Uh, so Urs, can you please uh, can you please join uh, or can you please share your experience with uh, with what you did with Mustache and everything? Yes. Hi. Uh, I have been working with Mustache and Moodle before this release already. One short question: Do you hear me? Is it everything okay with the yeah, sound it's, and it's very good. image, etc.? Et so I have been working with Mustache and Moodle before. I had tried to integrate uh, templates in themes, 
And so I have some experience with working with Mustache and PHP and was very eager when this um, yeah, Mustache finally got implemented in Moodle to see how this way, how, uh, how Moodle a or Moodle implemented Mustache is working with my knowledge of the theme work. And so I yeah, started to convert um, the clean theme into a mustache based theme. And I will switch over to the IDE. Um, and is it working? Stop sharing. OK. Yes, we can see your screen shirt and now with okay. ID. OK, now I found something. After we tried it yesterday, I found a presentation mode. Oh, excellent. And this looks much better, I guess, <laughs> because David mentioned yesterday that it was a little bit uh, small. Now I need to find to view the project. So, OK, I just um, go through, because we have 10 minutes, I just go through and show uh, what I did uh, to, to, by comparing the parts or the, the files in the two themes. One is clean, which is the upper part. And the other one is the lower part, the clean and theme, the theme based on mustache. The basic differences are that mustache, or the, uh, the requisites are that for mustache, the code needs to be very clearly separated from the, from the templates, because mustache is a logicless. It means that there is no code generation logic in the theme. The, the uh, template needs some logic for loops and logic to integrate data, but no logic to create data, just to integrate it into the template. So the task was to split up all the informations which are handled in the layout files with echo calls into templates. The new, or for me it was new, that um, the data, general, data preparation is done with renderables and then integrate or rendered with a renderer. I know that it is a little bit older, but I never worked with these renderables before. So um, it is important to, in the first step, move out the data generation part, which is here in the header or in the, in the starting page uh, part of the page, out into the yeah, the renderables and render. The renderables are implemented as outer loading classes. So we have for each of the old layout files in clean, we have one renderable, which I called columns one to, to have the same name. Uh, as a reference, this is what the layout or for the layout. I think the naming is not perfect. Um, I just uh, did it this way to remember where it's coming from, so it's more a historical aspect. Um, plus the renderer, which is a separate clause. And uh, you see the additional one, the base layout, which I introduced as a wrapper, so that columns one, two, three, only has the individual parts of the of the yeah uh, for the for the template for specific for this page. Um, 
so data generation from column one. No, this was um, sorry. This is column one. Uh, I think I will start with column three because there are more is more information. Data generation um, goes to column three layout. The renderables are standard Moodle renderables, so everybody being used to work with renderables should should uh, see or should know what to do here. And uh, if not, please have a look at the documentation. I won't go too deep into the uh, single parts. Um, you see that uh, parts or code, which is generated up there, is moved out of the layout files and into the renderable. So the renderable in the renderable, all code is generated and saved into a variable which is called data. And the renderable just returns the data. The other part, so the code generation is moved out of the layout file into the renderable. The now I switched the logic, sorry. So column three, the layout file. The other part, the structure, the HTML, which I may show here, at, uh, reference the header, is moved out into templates. And here I also, or um, did the same. I created a wrapper layout, which is just a collection of calls, uh, giving the base structure, the very simple base structure with the sorry head part, body includes, and the and the closing part of the of the layout, and then include the renderers for, no, the templates for the special page. This is the column three moustache. This is the column three moustache. And then we see this is the upper part shows the former standard Moodle three columns PHP layout file. And the lower part shows the template. You see the structure is similar, but all the PHP codes are referenced with mustache yeah, code. For me, this kind of or this um, yeah, templates are much easier to read. So for me, it's a big advantage to be able to work, where is the custom menu, to work with, uh, with templates because I get a faster understanding um, what I'm working with. And the clear separation of the code out of the, sorry, this oh, this is a lower part, this is new, and up there is the old one. And the clear separation of code generation and rendering is a big advantage as I see it. So, short look at the time. Okay, about 10 minutes. Um, maybe one short information. Um, I changed, or one important information is the layout file has uh, massively changed in the um, mustache, um, yeah, mustache driven theme because the only thing it does now is um, handling the renders or calling the renderer, renderables and the renderer. 
that's all. And the decision which um, template and which renderable shall be used is done or integrated in a changed config each for each setting or for each page type I added the renderable information so that the in layout the correct yeah, parts can be taken and rendered in the end okay I think these are the basics okay thank you very much Urs. Uh, may um, I have a quick question for you please yes you know uh, in the history I've uh, often heard that uh, generally Moodle themes and the Moodle output uh, generating system is too complex too heavy for theme designers who would like to see more HTML more just CSS and uh, we were often blamed to be very code oriented like yes theme generally had to know a lot about PHP and everything do you think this is a step in the good direction to to make the whole system more you know pleasant for theme designers yes I think it is um, because as I try to show the templates are easier to read and easier to understand mm -hmm. and um, I think when all the renderable stuff is correctly done or the data collection stuff in the renderables then there is no not often the need to change the render the data collection when you want to to move elements on a page around or to to redesign the page it is it from my understanding it will be only necessary to go into PHP code when you want to add new page parts so you need new data which are not offered by Moodle core so um, when you work on existing themes and want to change the pages it is it should be enough to just change the templates mm. and the CSS which belongs to the templates only when you want to add new information uh, add an area with extra information or something as it's done in some essential uh, theme for example then you need to add code and this is done in renderables mm -hmm. so in basic just changing should be much much easier and much easier to understand right there is there is a quite a good comment from Tim Hunt in, in yes. the chamber chat he's also commenting that on one hand we can see more HTML here in templates that can be more natural for thin designers on yes. the other hand maybe the whole system mustache is still pretty heavyweight you you need to understand a lot of things still so maybe it's not uh, maybe the fair thing is to say that it is you know uh, more pleasant or more natural uh, for theme designers to work with yet still they have to understand a lot of details and processing behind behind this yes but I think if you work with a complex system like Moodle you mm -hmm. need to understand a lot of things yeah, that's it's right. The same when you start working for WordPress or start working with Drupal. You have a quite steep learning cu curve to understand what's happening and how you can work with it. Yeah. So you ca you can't make it uh, that easy that you just say okay change some CSS and you have a beautiful very differently looking theme which really adopts for example the website of, of a school or a high school or something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so if you if you go that deep and not only change colors or different font or some images you need to know a lot about the system yeah yeah let's say the the, the old 
wisdom should be true, that simple things should be easy and complex things should be doable. And I think this, this new framework is an example yes. of this. Yes, I think it is a first step yep. and hope that the element library which I have, huge hopes that it will be um, helping mm -hmm. in this process even more mm -hmm. because their um, uh, central pool of information can be saved and used by design theme designers and developers because um, it is not only the complex background in Moodle, but it's also um, consistency, which is an issue. Because in Moodle, there is lots of areas of code which are created different than other areas. Mm -hmm. And if you try to change the look of a site or of a Moodle, Side, um, it would be very, yeah, comfort or very easy if yeah. you just say, okay, this page part, let's call it a widget, is looking in a diff in a different defined way, and you change this, and then you change to a different module in Moodle, and the same page area looks different, yeah, because it's constructed differently. And so, I think uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, very important work, which hopefully will be done in the near future. Okay. Excellent. I, I, I want just, uh, let me just add that uh, the other advantage of these moustache templates is that uh, they are usable directly from JavaScript. So we yes. can now use the same templates for for the output generated by PHP as well as on the client side only. Boris, thank you very much. It was it was excellent and and very useful and helpful presentation and uh, and sharing. Yeah, thank great. you very much for coming. Yeah, and you see you on the forums and everywhere where we will continue <laughs> discussing uh, discussing your experiments with new uh, new themes. System. Okay, you are hoping I continue. <laughs> I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. See you. Yeah, you're welcome. See you. Okay, and I think we are passing the microphone back to Perth, where Damon is waiting to uh, to introduce us to a new unified AJAX script handler. Damon. Hello. Um, I will. Get back to Tim's questions about uh, some more template stuff in the dev chat um, after this. Uh, so what I am going to show you is about a new um, set of JavaScript and PHP uh, code that lets you, instead of um, if you're writing a new AJAX function in Moodle, the way that um, we previously have always done it is you would write some JavaScript and you would write a new AJAX uh, script in PHP um, which would take the parameters from an AJAX request, uh, check the format of all the parameters, do all the security checks, make sure you're logged in, um, and then call some API in Moodle. Uh, and often that API was created just for the purpose of the AJAX script. And then uh, format the result in some way and send it in some format back to the um, JavaScript. Uh, that could have been JSON format or it could have been just a custom format. Um, and then in the JavaScript, you'd have to parse that format and then do something in the page with the response. Um, and we would redo that whole chain of events every time we wrote a new bit of AJAX functionality. So uh, when I was looking at doing the um, template work, uh, I got to a point where I needed to make some AJAX calls, and I didn't want to go and just create another one of these scripts and do the whole thing again. So uh, we had this discussion, and we came up with an idea of having a single AJAX um, script, uh, which can call any what well, can call web service functions. So uh, all of the existing web service functions could be uh, um, called from the JavaScript, uh, and any 
anytime you're writing some new AJAX functionality, uh, you would write it as a web service and call it from this new script instead of writing a new script to handle the AJAX request. So um, the benefit is that then the web service gets a new web service, which is probably a pretty useful service given that um, uh, we're building some AJAX functionality around it. And, um, uh, and all of the web service things like uh, checking the types of all the parameters and checking the return types and doing all the security checks, um, all of that is in place already. So you know that the quality of the, uh, the AJAX script is going to be quite good. So um, to give you an example, I will show you something. Uh, which one's the terminal, Raj? Um, that's that one. one. Yeah. That's okay. Font size of that maybe. Yep. Is that big enough? Yep, I think it's already now. It's green. Oh, that's right. Um, so what I have here is just an admin tool with one page um, in it. And this tool adds a web service. It's just called add, which adds two numbers. Um, and that web service is just a standard web service, which so when we're writing a web service, we define what the parameters are, the types, defaults. Um, we implement the web service by checking the types and then calling some other function and returning the result, and we describe the format of the result. Um, so all of that's the same. The one thing that's new is that I've added this um, uh, is allowed from AJAX function, which is how we whitelist which web services are safe to call from uh, JavaScript. So we didn't want to just open up all the existing core web services, although the core ones should be OK, because they're all checking permissions and things like that properly. But the area that we had concerns about was maybe there was some web services uh, that um, people downstream have created, which might be designed for a specific purpose, like maybe it's a uh, enrollment sync with some external system or um, something like that, which uh, instead of implementing the security checks, uh, in the web service, they might have just like created a web service user and restricted um, that service to that one user uh, instead of building in all of the capability checks and things. So that we thought that there may be some cases where if we just opened everything up, we might be exposing some data um, which uh, people didn't want exposed. So you have to actually whitelist the functions that uh, are going to be available to call from AJAX. Um, and you do it by just having, so it's like function name underscore is allowed from AJAX. Um, just add that to your uh, external services file, um, and that makes it available. So once we have that web service, um, then we can call it. So this is just some example code of how we're calling it. So I'll show you the page in a second, but the page just has some buttons in it. And when you click the buttons, it calls one of these uh, solve one, solve many, or solve wrong functions, which is make this AJAX call. So this file is a AMD module, which is the new JavaScript modules um, that we've added in 2.9. And AJAX is one of the core modules, which comes with that. Um, new framework, and so you require it, um, and then you can just say ajax.call, uh, the method name, give it the arguments, and then you give it a function to call uh, with the result. 
um, and you also give it a function to call if there's any exceptions. Uh, and so that's how that works. Uh, so one of the so now I'll switch to showing you the actual tool. Okay, so this is showing some examples. Uh, so when we do the first one, that makes an AJAX call um, to that external function, returns the result, and then updates the answer for that first uh, first thing. Now this is Firefox. Uh, how do I show the network tab in Firefox? Uh, so you, can I. you can use tab level. Command Alt I. Alt I. Inspection. I. And you can go to um, network and then reload. Well, so. Yeah. Okay, so that first um, example triggered one AJAX call, which sent. Um, data. Looking on the params at the top there, middle. Yeah, like that. So basically saying, call this function, here's the arguments, and then the response comes back um, as a JSON object, there's no error, and the result is 6. Now, more interesting is the second example where I've got two um, calls to that function. And Although there was two calls there, it only actually made one AJAX request, um, which is something that you can do with this new script, is you can send multiple, you can call multiple functions and get multiple responses with one HTTP request. So that is really uh, something that we need to do when we're thinking about mobile and slow networks. Um, so each round trip that you make is um, incredibly slow. So we want to minimize the number of round trips when we're doing AJAX types of functionality. Um, so we can see, in this case, the, uh, the data that was sent, there was two uh, requests to the same function with two different sets of arguments. And the responses came back indexed uh, for each result and response. And that did uh, both of them. And then the last example shows you, um, because we're using the web service functions, um, it actually does proper validation on the types of the arguments. So in this case, the arguments were declared as integers, and we actually got a real um, web service error um, because we sent the wrong data in the request. And just jumping back to the terminal. So that one? Yeah. Open okay, so back to the terminal. Um, this is the second example where we're making multiple requests in one AJAX call. Um, so basically, AJAX.call accepts an array of um, requests, and you just put multiple things in the array, and then you can have multiple um, done handlers uh, to handle each individual result. There's also a way to handle, uh, if you, to send multiple requests and to get all the results um, as an array to one function. Um, one question here. So in, in case the second fails and the first call didn't, the first uh, AJAX call will be fully done or it's going to be exception for both? It will do the calls in um, order. 
uh, and if one of them returns an exception, uh, then it will stop and won't return, won't call any of the following functions. Um, Tim Hunt's asking why we're always posting and we never use get um, in any of these, uh, which obviously reduces cacheability uh, and other such things. And Pat is wondering where the says key checking is, which looks to be a bug. Uh, yeah, I'll check up on the sesh key. Um, I thought that it, when I did it, it was okay for sesh key, but um, if it's not, we should add it. But that's an example of why we should only have one of these um, Ajax, well, as few Ajax scripts as possible, because they're actually quite hard to write and make sure that there's no um, uh, security holes in them, like um, Heather mentioned. Uh, so Tim Hunt's question about um, the fact that they were post requests. That's so that we can send the request as JSON in the data of the request and get a response. And that's how we chain multiple things together. So um, uh, if they were get requests, so the similar, so the, the place that you see get type requests for these things is um, something like a REST service, um, which is something very different to what we're talking about here. Although we have REST as a web service protocol, um, that's not really REST. That's like a thing that maps REST onto a functional API, um, but that's not what REST is supposed to be. So uh, that's not a good example to follow. In terms of the cacheability, um, this method doesn't handle the cacheability uh, for an Ajax call, because what you're actually doing is calling a function. You're not requesting a resource. Um, there would be cases when you are requesting a resource, um, but uh, but that's often not what you're doing with a web service. Okay. Thank Thank you, Damon, for for the answers and comments. Just uh, Just for the record, is quite a live discussion in, in the Jabber chat about some technical details of the current implementation that I'm pretty sure the development team will yet pay attention before this new this new useful feature is released in 2.9. Was there something uh, something else you would like to co elaborate on? No, I'll uh, respond to the questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, we thank you. There is also, you know, as usual channels as tracker and the forum discussions and everything where we can we can surely continue discussing this uh, in, in into details. Okay, thank you very much, Damon. Let us uh, move on a couple of kilometers to the east, where Peter Skoda in New Zealand is waiting in his own time zone to present us. Uh, some new uh, new handling of time and time zones and time dates in Moodle 2.9. So, Petr, can I ask you? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Hey. Right. So, uh, we were facing quite a lot of problems in Totara. We developed a few in-house solutions, but, well, unfortunately, they didn't work much, so in the end, we decided to just replace everything. So we coordinated this with Moodle HQ, and the result is now available in Moodle 2.9. I have a little presentation. It's mostly just a cheat sheet for me so that I know what to talk about. There is it. So, time zones reboot. Uh, time zones, I think it goes back to Moodle 1.4, 5, or something like that. Uh, it was developed in Moodle at the time where, when PHP didn't have big support for time zones or for the date operations in general. So, everything was 
created from scratch, and Moodle was using the time zone data not from the operating system, but from a special file. And over the time, it started to just lag behind everything else. So everybody else got the time zones properly. So it's probably time we do the same in Moodle. Uh, one of the main problems in Moodle is that it's very hard, well, was not anymore. Uh, the problem was that you couldn't easily get a user time zone or a current server time zone, it, mostly because there was a magic constant 99, which means you either use uh, the default from operating system or use the default from server. So the first task for me was to create a new class which returns current user time zone string which is compatible with PHP and also current server time zone which is compatible with PHP. And once you have this time zone, then it starts to be all much easier. So first decide if you want user time zone or server time zone. Server time zone is not used much. It was mostly in cron scheduling, uh, statistics, bulk imports, exports. Everywhere else, Moodle is using current user time zone. So when you enter any date or when you print out any date, it's usually current user time zone. There are some exceptions, such as when sending emails to users, then you are using the time zone of the target user, the same for calendars when you are exporting. And in some add-ons, there are some special areas where you might be planning a real meeting in person online, <laughs> well, not in person, but online meetings with multiple attendants from different time zones. There it's usually good to display the current user time zone, but at the same time, some fixed time zones such as UTC or something. We use the same for these developer meetings because it's much easier to organize everything. So uh, we can finally implement this too. So when you are entering the dates, in Moodle you are always supposed to use mform elements because it does all the normalization and conversion between calendars. When you are entering dates elsewhere, it gets a bit more tricky because uh, if, it is, if it is a server time zone, then you usually enter, then it's usually repeated events, and there you need to enter minutes and hours, and then there's the special calculation of the time for each date, for each individual date or day of month. So when you actually view those settings, it would be nice to have, or when you want to set up some advanced things, it would be nice to have a new forms element with time zone option. It's not implemented yet, but technically it's not a big problem. So if there are any volunteers, it would be a nice little job. When you are storing the dates, Moodle's using timestamps, UTC timestamps. So once you get the date from the user, it's always converted to a timestamp and entered into the database. When we are displaying the dates, it's converted back into the localized date in current user's time zone. There are a few exceptions, such as scheduled task, which is using a different format and some admin settings are using hours and minutes because those are usually repeated things. So here, ideally, we should be using the date in original format with the original time zone, like all the other databases and other systems. This is a little bit problematic because if the DSD definition is changed, sometime in the future, all the dates which were entered 
from that time zones become invalid. So there's very little what we can do. We would have to create a new database field and we would have to create new forms elements and everything. So this is a big task. So I don't think it's happening anytime soon. Displaying of dates. Uh, there's one function in Moodle which is called user date. It should be used always when you display any user date. Uh, the reason is that different countries want to localize the date in a different way. And then there are also a different calendar types. So you shouldn't be using your own custom uh, time and date formats in your code. Uh, this is a little bit of a problem because all those format strings are in the old PHP4 uh, format. So the new PHP5 routines are using different format of the string. So ideally, it would be good if it could support both. But well, we are not there yet. Uh, so if we want to display a day, here's the core date, get server time zone, which gives you the server time zone. Or you can use core date, get user time zone. Previously, people were using uh, the CFG time zone and the user time zone directly. This wasn't working in case of the 99 constants. So these methods are fully compatible with the old code, so just use them instead of CFG time zone or user time zone. Calculations. That's one of the things we did very wrong in the past. So all the uses of DASEC are pretty much wrong and should be replaced with new PHP date time routines. So you have a time stamp and you want the next day. So instead of adding 60 times 60 times 24, you should be asking PHP, give me the same moment in this time zone tomorrow. You can use those other methods, core date, get server time zone object, and get user time zone object, which return the date time zone class, which can be used directly in PHP 5 date time instances. So it should be relatively simple to convert existing code. Uh, there is another way to do PHP date time zone things. In old Moodle, you can see quite a lot of uh, areas where if CFG time zone is 99, then do old PHP function date time code. So if you are migrating the code, the simplest way to do it is to set new default time zone. It might be user time zone on the server time zone. Then do your magic in PHP with dates, and then reset it back using set default server time zone. So this shouldn't be done in new code, but if you have old code that you want to migrate or where you want to fix the time zone related issues. This is one of the simplest ways. I have used it probably in half of the of the fixes I did in Moodle 2.9. So half of them new PHP 5 stuff, half of them old legacy stuff. It was always what was easier and safer uh, because we are backporting this to earlier versions. So a little summary at the end. Others use the right time zone from the core date class, which is properly normalized and always compatible with PHP. If you can, use PHP 5 date time class, of course, with the exception of user date, because only user date knows how to display the date properly. Don't use the day sec constant or any 60 times 60 times 24 calculations. You shouldn't probably try backporting it 
into all the stable branches because that's quite a lot of work. And instead, it would be nice if people concentrated on remaining issues in 2.9. So those are mostly those periodic things which I didn't fix yet. And also some calendar issues are probably still a problem. There are probably still some bugs. And there's one important thing uh, for the 2.9 release. We need to educate all admins how to update PHP time zones. Sometimes the easiest way usually is to upgrade PHP because time zones are embedded in the PHP itself. And then if we are stuck with some old PHP version, which might just be getting security fixes, there is another way how to update the time zones, and that is PECL uh, packages, those extensions for PHP. Or sometimes in things like Debian, they have a normal package which you can install, such as PHP time zone thing. So that's pretty much the overview. Thank Are there you. any major questions? Thank you very much. There was a, uh, one good question from Tim in, in the Jabber chat, whether we can check if the time zones are up to date at the server and eventually warn the administrator. Yes, uh, we discussed this. I think Marina created a new issue already. Uh, uh, theoretically, you can use PHP info because it tells you exactly what time zone data you are using. Mm -hmm. And the time zones are usually updated every like four, six months. So if you see that at the half of 2015, if you have a time zone from 2014, it's most probably outdated. Mm -hmm. So then we could warn them in environment that there is a problem. But the good thing is that, for example, the last update which happened about two weeks ago, they were just fixing historical data and Egypt because Egypt is changing uh, DSP pretty much every week, <laughs> depending on how much energy they have. So they are moving the time to and back like four, six times a year. Mm -hmm. So, but most, the rest of the world is usually just fine. Europe they are not changing anything. Australia is not changing anything. So US is pretty much set on some fixed rules which are known like many years in advance. Mm -hmm. So the actual updating is just some small countries which somehow want to change the time every year. So probably those administrators know that there are the problems and they are aware of this. So right. I I think it's not a big problem these days. So if you update like every two years, that should be pretty much enough. OK. Just uh, maybe we, we could uh, also mention that uh, to avoid misunderstanding, there are still a valid places where you can use DASEC and or these 24 hours calculations. Like if you know that something should happen 24 hours after this, it is still valid. I just don't want to, you know, scare everybody in the world that DASEC itself is like a constant we uh, must not think anymore. Well, I think it's like 95% chance that it's wrong. Okay. So <laughs> I, I grabbed the code base and then decided it's just way too much work to do it now with this big patch. But on the other hand, it's just the problem is there only twice a year. So, and there are quite a few places where you actually calculate this repeated thing. So, usually it's like a bigger design issue in the whole yeah, area yeah, of code. Yeah. So I, I admit it, that, that the fact that you need DASEC, it, it's a good sign that you probably wanted to use scheduled task or something like this. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Oh, well, that's a limitation of the calendar in Moodle. Yeah. It doesn't know much about time zones. So if you 
define repeated event and then do it in your user time zone, well, maybe you want to do it in a different time zone because mm. repeated task is very important in which time zone you do it. If you do a fixed deadline, then usually it's, it's a fixed moment in time and there's no big problem with that because it's the same in all time zones. But if it's a repeated thing like every week at 6 p.m., then you need to set the time zone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But there is no way to set the time zone in Moodle, so it's always using either the user time zone, if mm -hmm. it's like a normal course stuff, or if it's administration there, it's simple. Well, you use the server time zone. But server time zone is not used inside courses because the teachers and students actually don't care what the server time zone is. It's sure. more like for the server sure. side level and for administration. So uh, it would be nice if Moodle started to use the time zones more. So if you had an option to kind of specify the time zone when entering the date. Yeah, sure. Uh, That's a very natural I, thing. I to saw do. a new element that does it, but it was not very pretty, so it's not good for inclusion mm -hmm. in Moodle. But it's, it's very useful because you just can't set that there anything. And then once you save, you see how much it is in your own time zone. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, uh, just quick comments from the chat. Uh, yeah, repeating, uh, repeating events in the calendar should be the next big thing in, in this area. It's uh, commented by Martin. I actually think there some of those, uh, there was like weekly repeated thing. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the examples how to use the PHP 5 API. Excellent, excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Petra, for your work on this issue as well as presenting it uh, to all of us. Have a good time there and see Thank you, you for inviting me. See you next time, whatever time zone you will be in. Thanks. Okay. Man. And I think we are moving back to back to Perth again, where Adrian Grief is waiting to navigate us through the navigation improvements in Moodle 2.9. Adrian? Yes, thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, why is it? Is the desktop? Yeah. Oh, no, you have to share. Share. You have to share the application. Ah. No, if you hit, um, I think it's for you. Mm -hmm. No, present on the top right. That will do it. Sorry, did you share the desktop? Did you, I did, yeah. You shared the desktop. Um, there we are. We're not seeing it at the moment. No, no. But that could be lag. Yep, slides are changing then seems okay here. Uh, where's the hangout? The next one. This one. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. The next one. Alright. Just lag on here. No problem. All right. So, uh, user navigation changes. So, we've been talking about uh, changing the user navigation or navigation around Moodle in general for a fair while, um, and uh, specifically at the moment we're looking at user navigation. Um, so, uh, in 2.8, we introduced the user menu. Uh, as the first step to making changes around Moodle in general. Uh, in this release, uh, we've uh, now focused on user interaction uh, around Moodle. So we've made a lot of different changes all over the place, uh, all related to how the uh, user in general uh, gets around. Uh, specific changes that we've made, um, we've changed my home and we've renamed it to Dashboard. Uh, we've done this 
to try to encourage people to actually use uh, my home. Um, there's a, a general feeling that my home is uh, not actually utilized much at all by uh, students, and so we're trying to move people more towards that actual uh, location to uh, find general information. Um, the next thing we've done is we've introduced my grades into the user menu. Uh, we've changed the overview report and modified that a little bit so that uh, that can be used as a general base for having a look at grade information. Um, and one of the other things we've done is we've introduced and sort of collated all of the preferences into one location, uh, which is the preferences page. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, we've tried to make it more clear as to whether you're in a course or you're looking at your own information. Uh, so we've updated the headers. Uh, the main one is if you're just looking at user information, then you have a user header at the top, which has uh, information about the current person you're looking at. And if it's a page which is uh, to do with the course, but also relevant to a user, then we have a, a combo header. Uh, so we've got the course information at the top, and then a secondary header, which has got the user information. Uh, messaging has had a slight update. Um, quite often, when you want to message somebody before, uh, you would be taken out of whatever context you're in, so you're in a course, and moved into a site uh, context. And this could be jarring to people, uh, specifically students, trying to na navigate around Moodle. So uh, we've introduced uh, an Ajax page that will just sort of pop up on the actual page that you want to do, uh, do the messaging. And you can quickly send a message and close that, and you're not moved around Moodle uh, in the same way. Um, and the last thing we've done is we have simplified the navigation tree uh, so that we, we don't have as much uh, on that left-hand side. Um, the user menu is sort of taken over that part, as not, and all the other information has been moved to other uh, locations to make it more relevant. All right. So the important thing, and probably what most people are interested in uh, here, is how does this affect plugin developers? Um, so we have a, an API for the user profile page. Um, this allows uh, plugin developers to uh, create links on the profile page um, and uh, put whatever information they feel might be relevant uh, in that area. Uh, we've also, um, well, the, we've got a preference page. Uh, this is using the current navigation system. So all they have to do is link into the uh, navigation and put their uh, preferences there. Uh, and that will appear on that page. Um, and the last thing they really have to deal with is making sure that you've got the right context uh, for each page that you're showing, so that you can you're actually showing the uh, proper header where it's appropriate. Uh, all right. So the user profile. Um, to add this to your plugin, uh, all you all you have to do is put uh, this function. Uh, you put your component name uh, at the front, and then add my profile navigation, um, and then you put uh, of an information in there to create uh, the uh, list that you put into the user profile. I think I've got an example in the next one. Yes, so in that function, you just add a node to the tree. Uh, I have a, an example there. Um, so you just uh, tell it what sort of, uh, what branch you're sort of tacking onto. Uh, the name of this one, uh, the title that you want to give the actual uh, node, uh, and then a URL uh, if you want to direct it to uh, a report of some sort. 
If not, then you don't specify a URL. It could be just a, a subheader for that uh, for that node. Preference page. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this is generated from the existing navigation system. Um, developers need to uh, plug in uh, to this section through the user current settings. Um, and there may be certain situations where you want to set specific settings for uh, a user. Uh, and to do that, you just uh, append the user ID uh, when you're searching for the node. So here's an example as to how to get your hands on a, um, on a node. Uh, this is for user 102. Um, uh, as I said, it's just extending the existing navigation, and we have docs for this. So you can go to that URL and uh, get a full description as to how to add your information into the preferences page. Um, Right, page context. Uh, this is slightly tricky. Um, generally, it's the basic concept that I think is tricky rather than actually implementing it itself. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, when you're dealing with a page that is just strictly related to a user, uh, that you set the page context to the user context. Uh, this information will then filter up into the renderer and provide you with the appropriate header uh, for the page. Now, if your page has both information about a course and a user, this is where you want to use uh, a subheader. So you have your combination uh, for the course and the user. Um, the example there uh, shows how to create the uh, secondary header with the user information. Um, the way it's set out here, uh, this is specifically for user information. Uh, it's set out this way so that sometime in the future, uh, if you want to change the uh, secondary header to something else, it can take uh, different information and be displayed there instead. Um, I think what I might do is I'll just switch over to a running example to show you what this uh, secondary header looks like. There we go. So this is a prime example of what the uh, secondary header looks like. This is the secondary header here. I uh, can't see the uh, cursor, but the uh, picture and the name of the student, that is the secondary header. Uh, the main header, too quick, is the uh, title of the course. So uh, to get this combination, you need to put in that uh, context header to uh, have that second header generated. While I'm here, I must well show you how the messaging works as well. Uh, here we go. We have a pop up. We can type something here. And send a message. And we're not actually moved to it. We haven't moved away from that page, so we don't have any bad or nasty context terms. Uh, what's that? The cursor. That's the a blinking system. cursor. Oh, right in here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oops. Uh, sorry. That is actually my last page. Um, so, do we have any questions at all relating to this? Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, to be honest, guys are continuing discussing about the performance impact of the. Uh, the uh, recent development in this area. This was very nice indeed, and I really appreciate your uh, your mentions of the new API for the plugins developers, because from my own experience, people are very often asking for a way to extend user profile page to, to add new things there and everything. So I, I'm pretty sure this will be very welcome, and 
we will very soon get some feedback from plugin authors who want to use these new improvements. Uh, thank you very much. I think we can uh, we can finally move to the last item in, in the agenda. If there's not uh, if there is something if there is not anything to add to this yet. Okay. In that case, I'm passing the virtual microphone to Raj. And you are on. Thank you. So, um, I share. Okay, uh, today I'm talking about B hat panel run. Um, I hope everyone knows what B hat is all about. So, um, the problem we were facing is uh, the B hat is supposed to be run every uh, week before the release, and it's it's one of the mandatory uh, things which we have before we re release. So we have to make sure all the acceptance tests run on all the stable branches, and they should pass. The the reason being, we wanted something to be faster, and over the year, over the period from 2.5 to 2.9, we can see we have almost tenfold the steps we had in 2.5. So we are almost running 35,000 steps before we say it's good to release every week. Because of uh, the increasing steps, we saw how much time it takes to actually execute the whole suite. Um, it, it was actually taking 14 hours uh, to execute the whole BHAT suite. And now we, with the parallel run, we have um, almost reduced it to four hours. Um, the parallel runs which we are running is four BHAT suites running together. So uh, that makes us to achieve the goal within four hours. This helps us to get the results as soon as possible for the release on the weekly basis. Um, the difference in BHAT single run and a parallel run is it's actually backward compatible. So if you are running a single run, you just have to use the same old commands um, in init.php. And uh, for running, you use vendor bin b hat. And then you have to remember all that big URL uh, or copy paste it. Well, with the b hat parallel, you can actually use the same command to run a single uh, run as well. The only difference is if you're using run.php, you can't use it with the pause step where you use it for debugging. Rest, it's backward compatible. For the parallel run, we define a parallel uh, option to it and say, OK, how much parallel runs you want to divide your feature files into. So they all run in parallel and give you the results faster. So with init.php, same command, you just pass an option of how many commands, how many parallel runs you want, and uh, that gets initialized. Use the same run.php command to run the whole four suites, and you get the results faster. Uh, we suppose all the B hat options, like tags, name, profile, etc. Um, you can actually use different Apache servers for each run. You can use different DB servers for each run. You can use different Selenium server or have a grid, so as to get faster results. It depends how much resources you want to put in for your test server. Uh, this is a config which you can add you to your config.php, and you can define whatever you want as per Selenium server, um, Apache server, or a database you want to use. As per the parallel run options, they, what we are actually trying doing in the parallel run is we are dividing the feature files among different runs. So Every feature file might a feature file. Uh, every feature file is not of the same size. They don't take equal timing. 
So some feature files might take 10 minutes and some might take one hour. So the best way to divide it is by calculating the, how much time it takes per feature file and divide it nicely. So if you define this config, the first run will actually do it on a random basis. It divides the feature files randomly. And then next run, it starts using timing.json to uh, find out uh, what feature files are taking more time and what is taking less time, and divide them pa properly in each run. That gives you the optimal run time for any uh, uh, parallel run. If you want to run, uh, if you want to use without running the first run and want some good results, you can actually get the step count from a feature file. And uh, this can be used, uh, this can be get from uh, util.php update steps option. Um, well, the optimal run, which normally we, uh, we have seen on our system is four parallel runs, gives you the best results. But you can, dip, it depends on the system to system. If you have good resource system, it, it can go up to eight or 12 or whatever, depends on the system. Uh, there's no, no specific run you can actually go with. Um, you can actually run your uh, B hat now on uh, external CI servers like Travis or uh, uh, Circle CI. Um, for that, you actually have to define which run should be moved on each VM because Travis or Circle CI has a time limitation. So you can't run a 14 hour job on a Travis CI. They give you a, a, for a free site, it's 50 minutes. So you, but you can have multiple VMs running there uh, for a single job. So you can divide your run on, a, on that. For four run job, you can say, first to second runs on the first VM, third to fourth job runs on the second VM. And you can divide your job accordingly. For more information, you can see the build here, which was run on Travis CI. So you divide your run one to two on the first one, second one, third one, and go on. And actually, everything passes, it passes for you. You can actually get uh, Travis CI uh, and Circle CI uh, scripts on the forum post in testing and QA. Here, so the builds are here. This is how you can actually use it. It's officially not supported yet, but uh, we'll be looking at it later. Going back to the presentation. Come on. Okay, demo. Let's show how it actually goes together with. Uh, let's go with the demo. Where is the terminal? OK. For the installation, uh, if you're using normal init.php, it works the same way. Single install, nothing changes. Old style way of doing it. But if you go with a parallel install, you actually get two installs running together. It shows you what started and where exactly it is progressing for each one, depending on which process gets how much resource from the CPU. So this is for two runs. But in case you plan to actually extend it to three runs, you can actually define it with three. And it'll just install the third extra one after this. So this got installed. I changed my mind to having three runs now. And it's already installed. It's just installed the third one for you. 
So it's pretty much smart enough to say, OK, you don't have to reinstall everything. You just have to install the third one. When you run this whole uh, thing, you just have to say run.php. Any tags if you want to run, or any particular scenario you want to run, say name of the scenario, and it actually runs it. The total combined run will be for BH1 and BH2 will be like this. It took five minutes to run the whole mod data. And uh, then it gives you the details of what exactly is the output of BH1 and BH2. If something fails, it actually tells you where exactly it failed in the BH1 output. And similarly for the whatever has failed and with the exit code properly. Um, I think that's pretty much all about B hat, which I want to share. Any questions? Thank you very much, Raj. Uh, actually, uh, is there is there any limit of the number of processes that can run in parallel? Like well, if I have they, a really huge machine and yeah, actually I tried with twelve and it basically worked fine. Uh -huh. But the problem where we faced was uh, if you have multiple uh, um, processes running, we have some steps with the focus of browser, right. and they overlap and they fail. So uh -huh. the more you have, the more chances you have to use a rerun, so as to run one by one all those failed I see. Ones. I see. So uh, uh, the, there will be probably some optimal number of, uh, of parallel threads running around these two or three, uh, like that. Yeah. The, okay. Well, the optimal which we have seen is four. That's what we are using on nightly. Okay. Uh, but uh, you can actually use n number of it depending on how you set up your system. If you right. use a Selenium grid with different servers, <clears throat> or isolate all those runs, which you can. So basically, with that you can act, you can achieve anything. Right. And did I did I read you tried that uh, we are now at roughly 45 minutes for the whole whole stack test? No, it's it. actually uh, uh, f uh, three hours 53 minutes. Oh, this that's that's what we're getting from okay. 14 hours. Okay. So, so we don't have to wait 14 hours before yeah. release. Yeah. We just have to wait four hours now. It's definitely a progress. Thank you very much yeah. for your work on this. Thank you. OK, guys, uh, there is quite a live discussion about performance details in, in the upcoming release and a lot of other things. Uh, apparently, Moodle 2.9 will be a very good release with a lot of new features for both users and developers to, to look at it and look forward to it. Thank you very much for your work on this uh, new release. And uh, see you soon in three months at the next general developer meeting. Bye, everybody. Have a good time. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.